Hi everyone, my name is Tamara Taggart and I am happy to be here with you today to talk about how to be a Jedi City. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that we are working and living and raising our families on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations and we are grateful to them for allowing us to be here. I'd like to introduce Aftab and Rena, who are joining me here for um, this conversation about how to be a Jedi City. Before we do that, uh, Rena or Aftab, why don't we start with you? Why don't you let us know what it is you do here in Vancouver? So my name is Aftab Irfan. I'm uh, the equity officer for the city of Vancouver, which is a kind of a made up new role. I've been uh, in it for about a year. And my role is essentially to coordinate all the different city departments to bring more of an equity lens into the work that we do. So it's, it's kind of enabling the Jedi City, which we're gonna talk about in, in a lot of detail, I'm sure. Amazing, Rena. Thank you. Um, I, I feel I should introduce myself properly in the way that I have been taught. Uh, Ch'andat Hinudikyaang. Uh, my ancestral name uh, is Ch'andat. My ancestral Haida name is Ch'andat. And my English name is Rena Sutar. I'm the manager of decolonization arts and culture for the park board. Um, and that is uh, that has three branches, actually. One is a reconciliation branch. One is uh, arts and culture planning and policy, where we really take account of our cultural footprint in park spaces and, and community centers. And one is uh, arts and culture programming. So I think we need to start with what it means to be a Jedi city. Aftab, why don't you let us... Tell us what it means to be a Jedi city. Sure. Um, so Jedi is actually an acronym uh, that stands for justice, equity. The D is for diversity or decolonization. We kind of go back and forth on that. And the I is inclusion. So uh, justice, equity, diversity, decolonization, and inclusion. Um, and it is a way of talking about how do we make the city work for everybody. I, I would just begin by saying, I think we are not a Jedi city currently in Vancouver. I mean, I don't know if that's, that, that needs to be said, but we are in many ways a very inequitable city and we are very, a very colonial city. And so um, I think really it's like, how do we become a Jedi city? It's more of a, a goal rather than something that we've, we've figured out. And, and definitely for the two of us, it's like, it's, it's all the nuts and bolts of figuring out uh, what exactly that means. Yeah, it's interesting that you said that because I agree with you. I don't think that we are a Jedi city here. Um, Rena, when you're, when, how are you finding that role? How are you finding, are, is it, um, are you a, a welcoming voice uh, or a welcomed voice at the table? Yeah, that's a fantastic question because, um, because I was hired specifically for a disruption purpose. It was a reconciliation role and a decolonization role uh, and so it is welcomed, but also necessarily and regularly uncomfortable. <laughs> so I'm, I'm rarely in a room to make anyone's life easier or faster. <laughs> but that being said, um, I, I do find it's a, it's a ripe environment for people to start taking responsibility for their actions in creating the system that we've got now, which, as we've just said, is not a Jedi city. So if we can't, we can't make a Jedi city without first understanding what our role is in building the one that isn't to begin with. What have we built already? Don't we have to disrupt things in order to create change? Yes, and I think, I mean, it's interesting because I feel like uh, in the past year and a half, we have actually had a lot of energy of disrupt everything, like burn it down to the ground and, and just kind of start from scratch because we can see how much is broken with the way things are. Um, I actually always think about your metaphor of building the house or, or dismantling the wall. Do you want, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, uh, I, I kind of came up with this actually because my, my dad is a pretty competent builder. Um, and he was working on a basement suite and he, we were moving stuff around and kind of set up this thing and he was moving a load-bearing wall. And I said, how, you can't move load-bearing walls. There's a whole floor above us. Like, it's going to come crashing down. He said, of course you can move load-bearing walls. You just have to build a new one and then take out the old one. So for me, this is a, a, a fantastic metaphor for what we're trying to do because we're, we're trying to restructure the system. We don't want to tear it all down because the very first people that will hurt are the people who are already hurting. Mm -hmm. And so we have to figure out, first of all, what is, what is the blueprint of what we've already got? And then how would we build something better? And then build some tools, build some structure. 
to try to support this change. Because also, if we're trying to make things more equitable, that is going to mean some change, and we're going to need some change management as well. In your experience, do you find uh, that people are resistant to change? Never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to say it nicely, right? Like, people don't like change. They hate change. As a matter of fact. Um, so all the things that we're talking about to be a Jedi city, if you will, mean change and a lot of change. And it means making a lot of people that aren't used to being uncomfortable, it, making them feel uncomfortable. That's, that's a hard one. Yeah, it is. I mean, I actually think that this is why I like to use the Jedi term because it makes it look cooler, sound cooler than, than and, and just like a little bit easier to to come on board with and swallow. And I, and I do actually think I think this is really exciting work. Like I think I mean, it's super creative because we are talking about building new states like mantling and dismantling at the same time. If mantling is a word, I don't know. But there, there's this kind of creating new things and um, and in many ways creating uh, something that I think naturally is a better fit for people. There, there's a kind of, uh, I mean, you know, when I think especially, especially about decolonizing our, our workplaces, for example, it's like, what if we did show up with um, our emotions and, and with our bodies and with ritual? Like, it actually makes it a lot better to, to be together. And so I think there's actually a, a kind of inclination towards this work when we don't only see it as, you're, you're doing a bad job, you're doing a bad job, but, but there's that possibility of you know, painting a picture of where we could be going and how people could be, bring, could be bringing more of themselves into it. So yes, it's, it's a lot of, um, th there, is a, there is definitely resistance to it, but mostly what I'm experiencing in this moment is like, we know we need to do it. What is the possibility, what does it actually look like? It's mo much more of a how question then uh, why should we even be doing it? Uh, in this moment in Vancouver, I think that would vary in different contexts. Yeah, yeah and I actually want to push back a little bit on this idea that people don't like change, mm. um, because it's been my experience that most people, when they start to see a role for themselves, find this work very, um, very enriching. It gives meaning to what they're doing day to day. Um, so you're not just doing a park design, you're not just figuring out a, a renewal plan or, or a long-term plan for the waterfront, say. You're actually starting to think, what can I, what can I add that is going to be inclusive? What, how do I build that in at this stage such that I can have an impact that actual people will feel this in the landscape down the road? So I'm finding that people are really invested in this. And they, and they want to change. So there's a lot of people engaging in the learning, engaging in the conversation. But what happens is the resistance comes from the system because the system is set up to do something the way that we've always done it. So when we try to do something differently, that's when we experience resistance. And then the other thing that happens is that when you try to change, and this, this we can see in any kind of um, sort of recovery process or you know, um, any kind of growth process on a personal level, when people start to expect things of you, and then you start acting differently, they can get pretty mad about it. And so we as an institution, if we're trying to act differently, there are some people who are seeing that they've, we've, always react, we've always acted in a certain way that they've come to expect and they have that relationship with us, but now we're changing that, we're changing the rules, and that's really upsetting for people who have had long-standing relationships, relationships with us. So um, yeah, I think, I think that's where the change starts to get, the, yeah, get some friction. People are really hard to change about that when they think something, I guess, might be taken away from them in order for somebody else to have something. Yeah, and I think that's always going to be a challenge. Actually, if um, and I've done a lot of research because I'm doing a colonial audit on the park board. I've done a lot of research into the into the history, and I've seen how people resist some of the suggestions that we've had. Um, but it's never taking something away because you're not you're not dis. It, I've heard this word used actually. Someone feels displaced out of park space, which I find really interesting because they don't live there. We've literally displaced indigenous villages out of park space, but we're not displacing someone for taking away their Saturday afternoon recreation space. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a different thing. I think the, the resistance comes around people who are feeling uh, decentered, mm. not oppressed, just decentered. Yes, yes. So let's talk about community because um, you know, we live in a community and everything's for the community. The park is for the community and the farmer's market's for the community and 
the recreation centers are for the community, the community centers are for the community. Rena, what is community? It is a super complicated word that I think we use um, in at the at the municipal level. We use it very freely, um, but I think it's too unspecific. So we say that we're for community, but clearly there are groups who are not in our spaces. Like, why aren't Indigenous youth accessing the services at community centers? So when we say the community wants this, the community wants that, who are we talking about? Who, who are the ones talking to us? And then when we try to go to engagement and we, we're getting really low engagement among certain populations, say the you know, South Indian population or the South, South Asian population, well, they're not feeling welcome to come talk to us because of their previous experiences talking to us. So when we say the community is asking for whatever, I think we have to start drilling down more, like disaggregate that data to start saying, no, this group over here wants this, this group over here wants this, and now let's have a discussion about these competing priorities and asks, but not treat the community like it's a, like it's a unified whole. Yeah, I kind of feel like uh, maybe a way of saying it is some communities are more community than other communities. You know, they they, they kind of count more, or they they register, and it's about power, really. It's like if you if you uh, are a group that has power, you count more. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, I think it, it, it's interesting because um, there's also a cost to that. Like this this question of change, I think we sometimes underestimate the distress actually that comes from inequity and that comes from living on stolen land. Like as we become more alert to that and more conscious to that, uh, it, it just, it, it, that also feels awful to be in, in such a, um, a disparate system with, with people with a lot of power and people without power. And of course there's a, so much potential for conflict and tension and violence when you are set up that way. So um, I think there is a kind of architecture for uh, a Jedi city that uh, treats uh, the multiplicity of community as people who count and and begins to be a little bit more nuanced about, I mean, you know, like some of the uh, practices that we allow, we only allow for some communities and not for others. So the, the, the markets was, was an example of that. There's a kind of we are all about farmers market and, and, and that kind of, we talk about it as being vibrant and part of urban life and how amazing that street vending is, is, uh, is, is celebrated. And yet we don't celebrate street vending in the downtown east side and what's happening on Hastings. And there, there's actually a lot of vibrancy there, but it is those people, right? It is the community that is not quite community um, that we we don't want to see, and that somehow makes us uncomfortable. And and I think actually it's it 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 makes us un uncomfortable because it reminds us of the injustice of it all. Um, and so we you know uh, criminalize that activity, which is really not that different from the farmers market. It's just different bodies in that space. Mm -hmm. Also, if a farmers market is serving community, which community is that serving? We have people in this city without food security, people who don't have access to regular access to fresh, healthy food. We have many acres of parkland that we are not using to produce food for those people. That is a shameful position to be in. Um, we are working on a local food systems action plan for that. But I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that we're, um, you know, a Jedi city, I think, has a lot of different solutions and the municipal government is only one of them. But we do have some authority and we have some um, some leverage to, to do some things to take care of the communities, many communities. Um, I, I call that systems of care. We actually have a bit of a cult, I think, in society of, of individualism. And we keep, tell, we keep telling people, we're in a pandemic, and we tell people, remember, to, remember your self-care, as if taking enough baths and like lighting a candle is going to help you get through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, what about systems of care? What about what is the government doing to help create a network of systems such that people aren't more food insecure during a pandemic? You know, when you think about a Jedi city and you think about Vancouver, where we are, what excites you? What makes you, what, what, what drives you? Like, what, do you, what are you most excited about? We do have a lot of people with a lot of expertise who have been thinking about these issues for much longer. And that's why we need, we need to start turning to the kinds of leadership that comes out of justice communities, that comes out of, you know, um, 
activism uh, out of you know the the scholars who have been think, doing this like the thought leaders on all of this start turning to that kind of leadership rather than just have that be you know a, a little consultancy here or you know tell us tell us how we can how we can wield our power better no let's let's actually shift some of the power such that we can make decisions coming from a different place because we've already tried the status quo and it doesn't seem to be doing moving anything very quickly and it doesn't seem to be changing anything very quickly um, so maybe we need some bigger moves to try to put some leadership in the hands of, of people who have already been doing this work for decades now. Yeah, I love that. I, that really excites me too. I mean, they're a kind of, you know, I mean, people have survived pandemics and they've survived changes in climate. They, they, they've survived. And so, well, and especially Masquim, Squamish and Slavitut, you know, they, they, they know how to survive on this land and thrive on this land. And, and there's a kind of, if we can tap into those ways of being... Um, I think it's it's it, it, that is exciting, and and I guess maybe a little bit more broadly. I also when I when I kind of imagine what uh, what the future might look like, um, I see uh, some version of Hogan's Alley that that was the the black neighborhood in Vancouver reemerging. I see, you know, Chinatown revitalized. I see Punjabi Market. You know, like a kind of, and and that's super exciting. You know, to to bring the flavor and the texture of all the different uh, pe people who are actually here, like I think we have diversity, we just don't have, we don't have visibility and, 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 and we don't have power uh, distributed across. So, I mean, I think it would be really cool to have a more, a fuller manifestation of some of those cultures that are kind of underground and, and, and hidden and struggling to um, assert their, their well-being. Like, mm -hmm. That would be really cool to have. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. yeah, who even face barriers to our services because we work in a certain way. Mm -hmm. They're already there. They're already, we talk about placemaking. I don't think we need to make places. We just have to honor the places that they've already made. Uh, in a lot of the conversations in the city, we talk about, well, we talk about white supremacy and we talk about supremacy a little bit more broadly, which is the idea that some people are better than others. And, and of course, white supremacy was white people are better than others. And it was the basis of uh, taking of land and of people's lives, slavery, all, all of that. And I think, um, I actually think um, ableism is a version of that, right? There are certain bodies that are good, there are certain bodies that are not good or not as valuable. And so the move towards disability justice and accessibility is recognizing what's wrong with that thinking and, and yeah, beginning to build our cities in a way that um, uh, that can be reached by people in the wheelchair, people who are hard of hearing, people who are visually impaired. And uh, there's a ton of, um, uh, you know, tools in the design profession around that. And I think we've, we've largely figured it out in buildings. We haven't yet totally figured it out. And to your point, it takes time to, uh, you know, change our sidewalks and have the curbs be the right way and change the signals on the street. But yes, that's to me definitely part of, part of inclusion. Yeah, but the, the things that you change to make a, an accessible place benefit everybody. Yes, they do. Um, I, I always wonder, actually, when I see a ramp and, and some stairs, why, why didn't you just build the ramp? I can walk up a ramp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, we can make everything accessible, and it will still benefit everyone. And I think we, if we make, this is what we were talking about earlier, you know, some people resist the change, but making a more equitable city does benefit everyone. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up, how important is it to have... Uh, the people that are represented in the changes at the table where the changes, where the decisions are being made? I think you're asking it rhetorically. Yes, we, I am. Absolutely, <laughs> we absolutely need them. At the, and I mean, in the, in the disability justice field, we hear the, the kind of phrase of nothing, nothing about us without us. Um, I, I think, so I take that as a given. I think also there's some interesting dynamics around, you know, we, we really noticed it with the black community because uh, there was so much attention and, so, and this kind of sense of, okay, we need to fix that, we need to do something about that. And we don't have all, a, a huge black community here. And so they were really oversubscribed in terms of the demands on it. The nations are super, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the number of requests they get to be at tables, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's not really uh, uh, achievable in a way. And so, so I think there's this question of, yeah, to what, to what degree um, can we bring them in? And then what, what are, um, 
what are some ways to have their voices heard in a kind of an efficient way? Because they, they, if you're going to do this on a large scale, they are not going to have to be everywhere. Also, disability isn't just wheelchairs, right? Yes. Like we, right. disability is all kinds of things. Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, having everybody at the table would be fantastic. And if we had representation that actually represented the, the proportions of people that are out there in the population, that would be better. Um, but also, people have already told us all of the things that we need to hear. Like, we can still go to someone and not draw on all of their time to educate us on everything to do with disability. We can do that homework first mm -hmm. to make that conversation go further. Um, I, I think that that's a lot, um, and that's where w my learnings have come from working with the local nations and working with Indigenous communities, is that they've already said most of what we need to hear to be able to meaningfully move forward this project or this wood initiative, whatever it is we're trying to do. Don't do it without them, but there's a lot that you can do before you even bring it to the table to say, we're doing this, is this a good idea? Or would you like to be involved? Is there Are there communities we should be talking to? You know, Whatever questions you need to ask, they can be better questions than... I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wonder if it's more about being in relationship than having people physically at the table all the time. Isn't right? that the truth? Relationships, right? Yeah. It's probably the, the biggest thing you need for a Jedi city is relationships. Yeah, yeah. I would take that as a, as a key ingredient yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. This has been great. Thank you so much for this conversation. It really means a lot. Rena, Aftab, thank you very, very much.